Right, it's a fallacy that investors can't lose money when investing in bonds. Bond yields generally move with interest rates. A rising interest rate environment adds pressure to bond prices. The loss in the bond price is partly offset by the gain in yield, but this is only true if the bond yield is held through the cycle. So how should investors make use of bonds? What role does this asset class play in a balanced mandate or absolute mandate environment? So gentlemen, I welcome you to the program. Also interesting to note, let's start off with the current trend right now. We're seeing foreigners selling out of uh, uh, South African equities, but still buying up South African bonds. And it's all about the yield. At least this is what we're hearing. Kobe, let's kick off with you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a sentiment thing, number one. I think if you wanted to own bonds globally or anywhere in the world at the moment, you know, you're not really getting remunerated specifically in the West, you know, for the risk that you're assuming in those spaces. But there's, there's, a, there's a school of thought from a Western perspective that you don't necessarily want to own equities either, predominantly because you could lose money and there's obviously the volatility associated yeah. with equities. So the, the thing that you then do is you try and find fixed income or, or, or bonds elsewhere in the globe and you look in the emerging market spaces. Um, and I mean, look, American inflation running at three and a half at the moment and you can buy South African bonds. I think the two-year two -year yield or the all-be yields, so, you know, is between eight, eight, is eight percent and the corporates are yielding mm -hmm. about nine percent in South Africa so you know you're getting remunerated to some degree so you're just seeing you're just seeing some of that happening in the market at, uh, at, at the moment okay so Arno let's uh, kick it off with you now just taking a look at where we stand right now with regards to bonds I know that South African investors for a very long time were saying that uh, South African bonds look very expensive and then things changed quite rapidly only to take note of the fact that foreigners are finding South African bonds very attractive tell us about the new trends that have come to the fore because of the crisis um, well, there's definitely been a flight to safety. That's the first one. And you've seen that in the um, bond deals in developed markets collapse basically over the last while. Uh, there have been the fears about hyperinflation because of so-called printing of money, which I don't agree with. We can maybe touch on that later. Uh, but in essence, it's the first one is a, a flight to safety away from the risk instruments like equity, for example. Mm. And as growth estimates have fallen, people are starting now to worry more about in the immediate future about deflation. Um, and having said that, is there are certain allocations to uh, a component in a portfolio, to bonds. Uh, and what investors have done um, is to effectively say, well, we, if you look at, say, the U.S. as an example, 10-year bond yields trading a, a touch above 2%, yeah. uh, it is so much better to go offshore into a currency which could well outperform the dollar, uh, like the rand, for example, and earn uh, an 8% yield, current 10-year uh, bond yields in, in, in South Africa, roughly 8%, uh, in a currency which is likely to uh, be to their benefit, basically. Mm -hmm. So that on its own, as an outright trade, stands out. Uh, on a real yield basis, we yeah. stand out relative to uh, our peers, other emerging markets, as well as, of course, the, the developed markets. Mm. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the hedge fund type trades, which is to short one side of things and to go along the other, uh, to almost be, in a sense, uh, a sort of duration neutral, in a sense, so tenure yeah. versus tenure, or even to take uh, the option of borrowing money in dollar terms at practically zero and investing it and in earning 8%. Uh, that makes a lot of sense for foreign investors. There have been some, um, so let's call it pessimists as far as the local investors are concerned, who said, look, uh, you need to price in risk, there are political risks, etc., etc." But at the end of the day, it's supply and demand. And in South Africa, our inflation dynamics, yes, they have been sticky, but we're still earning a decent real yeah. return. So on the, just on those plain basic uh, metrics, um, we are still, in my opinion anyway, um, at, at worst, probably at fair value. We are not expensive yet. We are also yeah. not excessively cheap either. Well, let's uh, take a look, Roland, with regards to what risks are associated with bonds. And I think Anna really alluded to it when he said we've got a factor in political risk and there's a lot of worries about a possible default even in the European countries. And you look at that two-year Greek bond yield, it's sitting at 45% or so, at least uh, we saw that coming through at the beginning of this week. And we're looking at the 10-year yield in the US uh, breaching that key 2% level last week. So again, it's perceptions of risk, it's perceptions of uh, safe haven assets as well. But what, really, what risks really lie ahead? Is it just about default? Is that the ultimate risk? Um, well, there, there are different categories of risks. I think the most important thing to kick off with is generally there are risks such as um, the, the sort of uh, steepness of the yield curve. So these are sort of risks that all bond fund managers look at on a regular basis. What you're referring to is, um, is much more sort of uh, current risks in terms of economic risks. Um, 
and, and I think maybe I can ask Anna actually a question on this because the, uh, the flight to safety, which everyone is, is talking about, is, is obviously well entrenched. But how safe is it when the U.S. government gets downgraded and France gets, you know, sort of potentially downgraded and all these other countries? Um, is Switzerland the safest asset now in terms of, because that is a current issue, is I'm, I'm investing in a safe asset that isn't as safe as it used to be. Yeah, I, I think one of the issues about credit ratings is a, is, is a very topical one um, because these rating agencies at the end of the day make an assessment based on certain metrics, balance sheet of the country, political risks, etc. And I think the key point for the US downgrade was the fact that they said that they do not believe that the US has the political will to carry out the debt reduction plans that they came with when they raised their debt ceiling um, on the 2nd of August. But Take note, of course, is that of the three major rating agencies, only Standard & Poor's has downgraded them. Fitch and Moody's have kept their rating and said it's unlikely to change in the next 12 to 18 months. Having said that, they still remain rating agencies and we know they're notorious for being uh, a little bit behind the curve. So if we think about what happened in 2008. So don't always believe the rating agencies. However, here's the point. If we look at Japan, Japan was downgraded from AAA status to uh, AA+. Plus. Um, and in fact, has been downgraded again uh, already some time back. Look at where their bond yields are. Their 10-year bond yields trading 1%. So they, they have long time ago already been downgraded from AAA status. Did the market punish them? No. At the end of the day, the market, and by this I mean investors around the world, effectively uh, make their own assessment to those risks. And at the end of the day, they look at what the real returns are. So if you think about Japan where there's deflation, they might well be their bonds might be trading at 1%, but then you've got to look at what the real return is relative to, uh, to the inflation side of things. Same story with the US. Uh, um, Elini, you touched on an inflation being at th uh, 3%, or Kirby, you touched on inflation being at 3% odd for the US. What's their 10 year bond yield? 2.2%. Yeah. So negative real yields. So which is more attractive? US at 2%, Japan at 1%. On a real yield basis, it's actually Japan. Having said that, is you then got to look at and say, well, how much debt does each country have? And one of the metrics that gets used and uh, that's been sort of thrown around yeah. um, sort of across our screens has been debt to GDP ratios, which has been a big danger. And in, uh, in this respect, uh, for Japan, for example, they have a debt to GDP ratio of over 200 percent debt to GDP. The US, depending on how you measure it and which debt you're looking at, let's call it close to 100%. So twice as much burden on Japan, yeah. yet their bond Arne, yields are lower. If I could just now interject there, there yeah, um, you know, you, sure. you, you, you we're talking about real returns. Then tell me why are yeah. we seeing such a huge flurry into US treasuries? Why do we see this kind of move? We know that it's liquidating positions elsewhere to cover losses. Uh, we're seeing people actually going into the US dollar, into US treasuries at a loss. Uh, tell us about the thinking behind that when they can comfortably put money into South African bonds, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah. Again, what it comes back to is, remember that the yield to maturity, say on, for example, Japanese tenure or uh, US tenure, it's for 10 years, as you pointed out at the yeah. beginning of the, the program. It's if you hold it all the way through to maturity. The flight to safety money is almost certainly just going to be there for a temporary parking spot, if you want to put it like that, which is, uh, again, they're saying, at the end of the day, the uh, credit worthiness of the US government, as far as paying back its debt is concerned is still a better bet than that of Japan. So in the short term, when money's, when dollar money flows out of the equity markets in the US, where does it go to? Into the, the debt market in the US. So it's still it's dollar based effectively rather than yen risk. Oh no, maybe just a question quickly uh, from, from my side. As a fund manager, um, you, um, you obviously rely on the rating agencies when you look at kind of the, 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 gov the government-based bonds in order to try and give you some form of rating. But when you get to the corporate space and you look at corporate bonds, um, how, much work do you, uh, how much of that work do you guys do internally rather than trying to rely on the rating agency in order to give a rating? Um, you know, do you, do you only use um, kind of, you know, do you only use the rating agencies as a, as a proxy for that or would you, would you do some of your own internal work as well? No, it definitely we do our own internal work. So there are various metrics you can use. Um, there's some that are just sort of plain one digit numbers. So for example, when you're looking at a corporate, <coughs> um, one thing that you can use is a, a very popular measure, for example, is called an Altman Z score, which looks at the structure, the balance sheet, the income statement, comes up with a number which gives you a sense of what the probability is or likelihood of a particular corporate um, going bust 
effectively within a, a period of two years. That's one metric that we look at, for example. But then what you try to get a sense of, very similar to what uh, equity analysts do. So we have our credit analyst who basically goes in, looks at the balance sheet, looks at the income statement, looks at the industry, looks at the prospects, makes assumptions, comes up with an, a sense of how strong the cash flows are within that particular business in order to service its debt. Mm. Um, and then one can make a, a, an assessment as to uh, where your uh, uh, expectations are for that particular company uh, relative to what the rating agencies are saying. So, so we yeah. use the ratings as a guide, uh, but they are not the be all and they're not the end all. And what we try to also do is use quantitative methods, like for example, using a hazard rate model in order to generate uh, an expected uh, probability of default for a particular company. And yeah. then you can make an assessment um, in terms of what the pricing of that particular corporate should be. Oh no, um, just a quick question from my side. I think when, whenever I do modeling, and you certainly do a lot more modeling than I do in, in the bond space, I look at the sort of triangular relationship between uh, currencies, inflation, and, and the level of interest rates. Now, um, can you maybe just give us a brief overview of how inflation-linked bonds work? Because I think we should touch on that, uh, seeing we're talking about bonds. Sure. Um, inflation-linked bonds are fairly new in the sense of uh, in the South African market anyway, is they were first introduced in the year 2000. I think it was about March of 2000 was the very first uh, uh, inflation-linked bond that was introduced in South Africa, uh, the R189, which is maturing now in 2013. And it was issued at, at that time at a real yield of over 7%. Today, that particular bond trades uh, close to half a percent real yield. And that's because the, t the term to maturity is, is lower. But what's the structure of an inflation linker? It also pays, like normal government bonds, a fixed coupon. But where the key difference is, is that that uh, fixed coupon rate is uh, when you multiply it with the nominal amount or the notional or the principal amount of the bond, like a normal government bond, that uh, uh, principal amount is indexed to the CPI index. Yeah. So as inflation every month is measured and it, it is uh, recorded, the notional amount of the bond actually, so when it starts out at 100, it then accumulates basically going forward. And what's very nice about it that is it means that the underlying uh, income stream out of that bond, unlike a normal government bond, which is why we call it fixed yeah. income or fixed interest, because they're generally fixed uh, uh, interest payments you receive every six months. In the case of an inflation-linked bond, yeah. every six months, if there's inflation, it's going to be going up at exactly the same rate as inflation. So this is why inflation linkers uh, actually form a fantastic, uh, fantastically good component to any investor's mm. portfolio because at the end of the day, one of your main uh, investment objectives must be to keep pace with inflation. Yeah. And there's your perfect hedge, is investing in, in inflation linked bonds. Yeah, I, Having I, I, said I, I, that, I, I, that it sounds fantastic, is you, you can lose money in inflation yeah. linked bonds. This as is well. my question to you as well because I know that inflation linked bonds are starting to become a favorite when it comes to uh, including it in, in portfolios. I know Kimon Voyadzis from Trident Capital has been uh, beating on this drum for quite some time. Do you think that it should actually be part of someone's strategy going forward when you look at the South African case? We know we could be breaching that 6% target band. Tell us about the other uh, bonds that you could and should be including within a portfolio when you look at bond allocation as a whole? Without a doubt, uh, inflation linkers should form a part of any uh, investor's portfolio. At the end of the day, what you're really interested in are your real returns. Yeah. Uh, and there are times when normal government bonds uh, are overvalued uh, against linkers. So for example, if you look at the real returns uh, against the inflation linkers, there are times when you want to be in inflation linked bonds more so than nominal bonds. So if I use, for example, one metric that we use in bond portfolio management, it's a very simple one. You look at what the yield is on the nominal government bond. Let's say, for example, the R186 matures in 2026. So it's a 15 year odd bond. Then we look at the R197 as a inflation linked bond. It's currently trading around about a 2.3% real yield. The difference between those two, R186, let's call it 8%, 2.3%, yeah. what you're left with is a number 5.7%. That number of 5.7% is in essence the market's pricing of expected inflation over the next 15 odd years. Yeah. So now the question to be asked is, if we have an inflation target of yeah. 3 to 6%, and if the Saab sticks to that, that over time, on average, inflation is going to be between 3 and 6, let's call it 4.5 on average, let's add on a half percent 
give or take, to be generous. So on average, let's call inflation in South Africa, if the Saab sticks to their targets of uh, four and a half plus a half for a little bit of risk, so 5%, but the market's pricing it in at 5.7 yeah. between those two yields. And the question then is, if the market's right, then what you want to be uh, in, yeah. in is rather want to be in inflation okay. than uh, uh, bond we, yields. Because we almost, the market's right. Yeah. We, we're almost running out of time for this uh, half. So, sure. it could be, I know that you want to show us returns when it comes to bonds. So, just let's delve into that. Okay. Okay, well, let's. I mean, let's have a look at uh, at, the, at the graph. It's on your on your screen at the moment. I mean, it's a fallacy that you can't lose money in in, in bonds. Most people buy bonds specifically because they think they can't lose money in bonds, but it's uh, it's a fallacy. Have a look at those two lines over there. It shows the rolling 12-month returns, and that's in blue, uh, for the for the, for South African bonds, and it shows it over time. It's a very long-term graph. It goes back to uh, to 1925. And you can see the volatility in bonds. You can see sometimes you can make money in bonds and sometimes you could lose money as, in bonds as well. If you extend that period and you go to a five-year period, and that means you're now trying to invest over a rolling five-year period, so obviously the volatility obviously reduces, but you can see the kind of returns you can make out of bonds. Yeah. But it's a, it's a complete fallacy. A lot of people say, well, there's a lot of trouble in the system. Maybe I should buy bonds. You can lose money in bonds as well. It's not just like equities. You can lose money in property. You can lose money in, and you can't lose money in bonds and cash. That certainly is, uh, certainly is not the case. Okay. We're going to take a very short break when we come back we'll be reviewing the atlantic real income fund a fund honor should know inside out so we'll see you right after this